Welcome back. I want to take a quick second to tell you about our sponsor of today's episode of North American Deer Talk, CNE Wildlife Products. CNE Wildlife is a trusted leader in biotechnology for the cervid industry. They offer micro encapsulated bacteria products that are research supported through Texas Tech University. With more than 30 years of experience and commitment to all natural probiotics, this product line continues to be a mainstay in herd management programs across North America. And the reason is simple. They are passionate about the cervid industry. They have products for elk, whitetail, muleys, red deer, and more. With products ranging from Fawn Paste and Electromax to Guardian Plus, Whitetail Energy Pack, Jumpstart, or their ever popular Top Score Extreme, they just flat out work. We've been a CNE Wildlife product user for more than 15 years. To learn more about CNE Wildlife, check out episode 54 of North American Deer Talk, a probiotics masterclass with CNE owner Sadie Horrocks, and give her a call today to start using the products we do here. Hey, it's the Deer Wizard, host of North American Deer Talk. I want to tell you about a great new advertising and research platform that we've developed for you, CWDbreeding.com. You know, as the deer industry continues to mature and develop around chronic wasting disease and its known genetic heritability, resources like CWDbreeding.com become essential tools for deer managers across the country making decisions about their herds. I really wanted a platform that excelled at hosting GBV and codon markers in a filterable and searchable manner, but I also wanted to have high quality pictures, videos, ages, scores, NADAR numbers, and a whole host of other information to go along with that. This database puts everything in one easy to find location and allows you to access the industry's greatest genetic resources. I look forward to seeing all the great bucks that people have to offer in one easy to find location, cwdbreeding.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of North American Deer Talk. This is episode number 93. I've had this idea poking around in my brain um, for six months to a year. And I want to start talking about it with you all and see if we can make some headway on this topic. Before we get into that, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Not a YouTube fan, head over to Rumble. We do it there too. And if you're listening on some sort of podcast application, thank you so much. You can find us at Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay, so... <clears throat> The topic is how we talk about our farms, how we discuss what it is that we do with legislators, regulators, the public at large, other hunters, people outside of our industry that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis that may know kind of what we do. Um, other farmers and ranchers. If you don't raise deer, you don't exactly know it is what we do, right? So I want to touch on a couple points and let's see if we can kind of talk through them a little bit. Again, this is something I've been kind of thinking about and um, chatting with with a, a couple other guys and trying to develop my thoughts around it and you know try to be a, a better advocate for our our industry and what it is that we do and maybe a bit of the why because I think that's important and I I actually I think that as time goes on and and you and I explore these these ideas and these thoughts. Some of you may have already had them. You're like, oh, this is, I've been talking about this stuff for 15 years. Kudos to you. And, and, and we appreciate you. And I hope that you're a, I hope that you're an active voice. I have not heard tons of this. Um, and maybe that was because I kind of had some tunnel vision. <clears throat> so I made a, I made a post yesterday. 
um, on our Red Ridge Whitetails Facebook page, and I shared it out within a few of the groups. So I'm going to read that to you. Um, and this is just a, you know, super brief. Um, it, it'll take us three minutes to work through this, but it's just uh, something that I tapped out on the keyboard. And I'm going to try to keep doing this uh, because I want to get better at at being a good advocate and a, and a steward for our, our industry. And I hope that we all can, you know, develop these thoughts together. So uh, here's the post. They are not just deer. They are a future of abundance. My business and lifestyle has evolved over the course of the past two decades into something that is bigger than myself. With the advent of chronic wasting disease and an increased focus from all parties on animal health issues, especially conservation agencies, it has become increasingly obvious that my deer are the key to the success of North America's favorite big game animal. Hunting runs deep into the core of our humanity. We cannot, no matter how society looks at itself, deny our nature as humans and the relationship that we have with our heritage as hunters. For the entirety of our existence, we have survived as hunters in some shape or form. Fast forward to the modern day. Our awareness of things such as animal health diseases are real, and we have a responsibility to preserve the resource we care deeply about. It's my privilege to participate in this preservation project. Our operation today focuses on land preservation in the way of farm ground. This habitat is improved and managed specifically for, <clears throat> excuse me, white-tailed deer. Our use of propagating whitetails enable my family to live in a rural environment, provide income to support the local economy, and maintain and implement the use of the family farm for the long term. In reflection on how I have, excuse me, in reflection on how I can have personal impact on the big picture, our focus of using genetics coupled with known science of CWD susceptibility is providing a reservoir of animals that will impact the landscape of hunting and white-tailed deer for generations to come. Join me. So when I, when I, I think about that as a as a whole. I touched on a few points which I think are important. And the biggest one is that every person that I know that raises white-tailed deer is a hunter. I I I honestly don't know anyone that's not. And every single one of those people that is a hunter was a hunter before they started raising deer. I think this is important. I I think about I think about our our state of Pennsylvania, right? And and the reason I'm touching on this is because I I know our state pretty well. Our wildlife agency is called the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I I don't know one person in the Pennsylvania Game Commission that raises deer. I suspect there's many people in the Pennsylvania Game Commission that might not even hunt deer. But I don't know one deer farmer or rancher that, number one, isn't a hunter. Period. Like, we're all hunters and we were before we even knew that you could raise deer. And it was, it was that, it was that kind of, you know, introduction to, to deer in the outdoors that we said just was not enough for us. There's, there's something to be said about a life in the outdoors and a life hunting um, th that I think resonates with a lot of us. And it's important not to lose sight of that. And it's, I understand it's easy to do. And, you know, when we get kind of down into the nitty gritty of a lot of what we see visually within the industry, um, we forget about that, that kind of key component. 
Um, and that is that the whitetail deer has value because it is pursued as a, a big game animal or a hunt animal, um, a trophy animal, if you will. And that, that's not to, that doesn't discount its value at all. It, it only increases it. If the whitetail deer didn't have value as a animal that people wanted to hunt, it would be a cow. So let's not lose sight of that, that hunting heritage. Cause that's really, really the thing that ties us all together. Okay. Now, the next thing that I think is appealing and just work with me through this, right? Um, this is the first time I'm, I'm kind of working through this in a, in a public forum, right? So most of the people I know, um, they kind of mock the idea of, you know, climate change and global warming. And, and I think it's hilarious that, um, you know, the earth cools and heats and whatever, but people always want to gin up these things for, for political reasons. But let's just for a moment say, hey, climate change is real. Okay, gotcha. Well, what are you doing about it? Well, I participate in land conservation and land preservation. Well, Josh, how do you do that? Well, I have, I have some ground out here that would suit houses just fine, but it's pasture. Well, what do we know about pasture? Sequesters carbon. We hear all this. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm gonna use science in air quotes if you're listening on the podcast. We hear all this science about how it's important to sequester carbon and so on and so forth. Well. We could do that with plants. What's the greatest way to um, take carbon out of the atmosphere and stuff it into, into the ground? Well, that's through pasture. And what's a great way to get an uh, incredible source of protein to keep us alive? Well, that's to take ruminants and to use that pasture to our advantage. Well, guess what? Deer happens to be a ruminant. So that's what we do. We raise deer so we can conserve the land that it's on. Because it beats it being a sidewalk or a parking lot or a housing development or the 100 other things you can come up with that are, are not you know, pretty to look at and so on and so forth. So that's one. Now, what do we do with that land specifically? Well, for us, we tailor that specifically for the white-tailed deer. We make improvements to that land to provide the best habitat for white-tailed deer. We plant a variety of forages for them. We make sure that there's uh, increased access to water, feedstuffs, things of that nature. So we improve the habitat. Well, what happens when you improve habitat generally for white-tailed deer? Benefits a lot of other species too. I think that's a win. Sounds like a win to me. Now, when we use our when we use our land and we use the the land and the habitat that we've improved we try to derive some income from that and generate income and and revenue from that well what what does that do well that supports local economies it allows you to participate in your community it allows you to support um local families through employees. Maybe it provides opportunities for you to um, donate and be generous within your community. Those things seem like wins to me. I I'm, I'm looking at this 
And if you're like, man, Josh, you're, you're really, uh, putting this, these ideas on a, on a pedestal and no, this is the, this is the environment in which we must play. If you think that your business is immune from politics and policy, you're fooling yourself. I have tried to work within this system for a long time. And most of the time, that was me trying to fight it. I got nowhere. But the places that I feel like I am making progress are where I've used my head and I've embraced the um, ideas that others have had and I use them to get what I want. And generally speaking, what I want is what many of you probably want to. And that's just to be left alone, raise your animals, live your life, take care of your family, that kind of stuff. And we've talked about this before. Um, so I think supporting a local economy and community is a, is a win. And we do that through our, our land conservation and habitat improvement, which makes our businesses more robust and, and better. Now here's the, here's the big ticket winner. And this is the one that I feel is the most potent and powerful. And I think is going to open up just a world of opportunity for us. The improvement of genetic quality of our animals and the idea of pasture release and stocking. There is immense opportunity to fill in the holes within the North American uh, game model, right? Nor North American conservation model. The success of that model, in part, was based on two main things, in my opinion. And that is the idea that we needed to preserve the species of various game animals. Um, and they did that through regulation and, you know, bag limits and seasons, that kind of thing. Um, the other was, uh, increased genetic diversity and repopulation slash stocking. It's not something that the conservation agencies talk about much in the wildlife agencies. And, and just to be clear, what is a conservation agency? What is a wildlife agency? Uh, I'm kind of lumping them together because they have a very similar ideology. I'm not saying they're all the same, but um, groups like uh, Pope and Young, Boone and Crockett, uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, um, and then the various state and federal wildlife agencies. Those, those could be Department of Natural Resources. In our state, we call it a, a game commission. Um, if you're in Texas, they call it Texas Parks and Wildlife. They're, those are the, the agencies that are, are tasked and dedicated to, quote unquote, protecting wildlife, right? Whatever that means. So back to the improvement of genetic quality and pasture release. Well, what, is, what does that mean? So let's start with the first one. Improve genetic quality. Well, as someone as a deer breeder, that, that's what I do. I, I breed deer. I am looking at animals and specific qualities that they have and different traits. And I'm saying to myself, how can I take two animals, a buck and a doe, and have them create offspring that, to the best of my ability, exhibits these traits better than their parents or can enhance them further than their parents could. And, and you got to have some standards, right? But that could be 
you know, larger bodies, larger antlers. Um, and we've seen, we've seen these improvements through like on properties through hunting where selective animals are harvested, selected animals are, are, you know, let go, um, to live another year, do some breeding. And then, you know, there's the, the, through the use of harvest, these, these animals are kind of, you know, selected, uh, for their genetic quality. Now, what we've done is we've, we've really kind of tailored in on that. And we have a, a very nice controlled environment where we can do that, where we can pick a certain buck and a certain doe. And we've also, um, used DNA. So we know parentage without, you know, without question. And we know the production of said animals. We've used artificial insemination to increase that genetic diversity, as well as those uh, qualities that we're looking for. It enables us to, to use a, a much more, uh, or a larger gene pool to, to meet those needs that we have and exceed them in a short period of time. I mean, just, just turn around and look at this industry um, from 20 years ago with the kind of size and quality of bucks that, that they had available and where it is today. Absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable. 200 inch two-year-olds are everywhere. That is just crazy to me um, in a good way, not in a bad way. Like it's, it's unbelievable that we, that we've done that. Um, so now we have an animal disease in chronic wasting disease, a deer disease, let's be specific, a cervid disease. And everyone is shouting from the rooftops that this is the seminal disease of our times Deer herds are going to be eradicated. It's highly contagious, so on and so forth, right? Okay. Now, whether you believe that to be true or not, let's go ahead and put that in a box over on the side of the table. And let's just say that that is the case. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, that idea that all those, you know, bad things are going to happen needs fixed. I haven't seen any answers come from any wildlife agency to fix them. I've seen some positive steps on identifying the disease and, you know, putting a thumbtack in a map, if you will, or a, a you know, a, a dot on your, your digital copy with GPS locations, but I, I haven't seen any solutions to the disease itself. And the only tool in which we've been told that these agencies have is herd reduction slash, you know, depopulation. It's to kill animals. So there's less of a chance of the prevalence rate going up faster than it already is because there's less, you know, animal to animal contact or environmental overlap, things like that. Okay, that's fine. I'll accept that. What happens when you take a controlled environment, such as a deer farm, and you empower a breeder like myself with knowledge backed by science that has not been disputed to date? If anything, it's been validated continually, will continue to be validated, and you empower them with this information that enables them to create animals that, in aggregate, have a lower and lower susceptibility to CWD, which everyone else has been yelling that is the most important thing that we have to deal with tell you what it does. Just like I said in my last paragraph, it creates a, a reservoir of exceptional quality animals that can be used for 
repopulation and distribution efforts and pasture release in various capacities. You know what that's a win for? Everyone. If you're a if you're a deer breeder, and I, I I hope I hope that you've stuck with me so far. I'm trying to trying to be very clear with what I'm saying and say it in a manner that I think is is um palatable for all parties. And I'm sorry, I'm I, I got some dripping sarcasm on a few of my points because I just you know let's take this problem, let's whip it up. And, um, then when somebody solves it, let's try to discredit them. It's just, this is, this is old, you know, this is, this is old time politics, right? And I'm not saying the disease is the political disease, although it has a lot of political context. If that's the case, then we're going to work on, uh, fixing it in both arenas. Cause once you fix the disease itself, or you come up with fixes for it, the political arena changes. We're, we're changing that political arena. It's happening today as we speak. And I want you all to understand how powerful that this is and how important it is. I am raising animals to do all those things that we listed, the land conservation, the habitat improvement, supporting my family and local co- economies and communities. And I'm doing that through improving the quality of my genetics for not only hunting but so that hunting can be here in the future because we've been told that this is the devastating disease and we now have the key to unlock that so i'm just gonna i have my little list of notes there i'm just gonna leave that with all of you um Start thinking about your operations. And 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 again, I don't I don't have a hunting operation, but I do stock animals. Um and I I think it's a it's an important thing that I do, and I am actively working towards trying to make my genetics better on many different levels. I mentioned this before. I'll I'll, I'll say it here quick. It's gonna take me a couple of minutes, but this is I think you guys are gonna like this. The first, the first state agency, as long as the rollout's good, the first state agency, which develops a program in conjunction with the private deer managers, the deer breeders, guys like me, to create some sort of, um, liberation program, pasture release program, stocking program, DMP program, whatever you want to call it. A program that increases the genetic quality of white-tailed deer, not only for trophy value, but also for disease management, specifically chronic wasting disease, wins all the cards. If you create a destination that has high quality white-tailed deer, that has low disease prevalence, hunters will come from all over the country and try to come kill some big bucks. They just will. And when they come, they will spend money. They will stay in hotels. They will eat at restaurants. They will buy new guns and rifle scopes and binoculars and hunting clothes and support all the local uh, stores within a, you know, a a certain range of, of their, uh, their hunting spots or their leases or all the things that benefit from the outdoor enthusiast. So they're going to sell more out of state licenses. That's there's big money in non-resident licenses. So what does all that money do? If you're running a business and it's in this outdoor experience space, this hunting space, this wildlife agency space where you're, you're 
your goal is to have the best quality habitat and the best quality animals, you're going to reinvest that money. And it gets better and better and better. And somebody's saying, how do you fund that? I'll give you some quick numbers. There's 895,000 deer licenses that are sold in the state of Pennsylvania. They're $36 a piece. You raise the price $1 per license sold, and it goes into a wildlife fund. And that wildlife fund now has $895,000 in it. What does that do? That gives you a lot of jack to go buy some nice, high-quality reader bucks and stick them into known disease areas and start altering the genetics. That could be step one. You could also raise some money and you could fence off, you know, 10, 15, 20 acre um, pieces of ground within that area and bait a bunch of does in in the winter or, you know, in the fall, drop a, a high quality buck off, let them breed, take the buck out or let them go with the, the deer, make sure he's tagged up and collared, tell people not to shoot him, and all those does are going to go out there and have fawns. And they're all going to be carrying those those genes that are that are lower in susceptibility. And the process goes on and on and on. Boy, that sounds like a win for the hunters. Sounds like a win for the farmers. Sounds like a win for North America. So come along. Let's work on this together. If you have some thoughts about this, I would love to hear them again. I work on this stuff every day. This is all I think about. Wish I could think about other stuff. I don't even know what what are, what are, what are we going to do when when CWD's gone cuz it's it, we're going to fix this thing. It's going to be wild. I don't even know. Maybe I can kick my feet up and relax a little bit. I don't know. But anyway, I hope everybody's good. You know, it's uh I said it's a responsibility and a privilege to do this. It certainly is. So I appreciate all you. We're going to check out. With that, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk. <laughs>